Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I start by thanking the ICD President Zapatero and the Director General Mark Donfried for the kind invitation uh, extended to me to be part of this uh, uh, memorable conference. It's, it's the second time that I visit Berlin. Last year, we enjoyed a great celebration of 25 years of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And this year, really, we look forward to 70 years of the United Nations. Uh, that's the inspiration for my speech, my brief speech. Um, indeed, this morning, President Zapatero did speak about the 70 years um, of the United Nations. And as a judge of the International Court of Justice, which is the principal judicial organ of the UN, uh, I just take note that it's also 70 years old, the court. And uh, next year, I think we have something planned to celebrate the 70 years at the court in The Hague. I'm not sure that there is much to celebrate about uh, as much as to take stock of the achievements, successes, even failures, and new challenges facing the United Nations. Uh, in my talk today, um, I, I, th there's a lot that one could say that uh, has happened in 70 years of the United Nations. I'm sure when I say that, maybe as many ideas as we, we have participants would cross your minds. But I want to focus on one aspect, and that is Millennium Development Goal, uh, or um, it's actually now Sustainable Development Goal number 16 whose text appears on the, on the overhead, and I will explain why. In September of this year, world leaders converged in New York to take stock of how much they had achieved under the Millennium Development Goals, MDGs, set up 15 years ago, as well as to map a way forward for the next 15 years. They adopted the 2030 Agenda for Development, which included new goals dubbed Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. According to the UN Millennium Development Goals report of 2015, significant strides have been made globally at reducing extreme poverty and hunger, achieving universal primary education, gender equality, and women empowerment, maternal and child health, combating HIV AIDS, malaria and other diseases, ensuring environmental sustainability, and developing a global, a global partnership for development. However, the report also shows that there is significant disparity in progress and achievement between the developed and developing countries. This is because each government was left to set its own national goals or national targets and priorities, depending on its resources and national circumstances. As a result, many countries were unable to realize the MDGs within the 15-year time frame. Furthermore, the UN family faces new global challenges, including climate change, global terrorism, international crime, including human trafficking, cybercrime, and conflict. Be that as it may, the value of a unifying agenda underpinned by shared goals and targets cannot be underestimated. The new goals, or SDGs, and the broader sustainability agenda go much farther than the MDGs in addressing the root causes of poverty and the universal need for development that works for all people. The question and challenge is whether those countries that have lagged behind in working towards the achievement of the MDGs will be able to achieve the even more ambitious SDGs. I wish to share some personal thoughts and reflections on what I think needs to be done in achieving Goal 16 whereby countries and their governments commit themselves to promote peaceful and inclusive societies 
for sustainable development, to provide access to justice for all, and to build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. Interestingly, goal 16 is one of those goals that was not included in the earlier MDGs. 12 targets have been identified under goal 16. And as I was asked to briefly share my own perspectives, I came up with six words beginning with the letter P around which my ideas are encapsulated. I hope I can work this machine. So the first is people. We the people, that is you and I and others around the world, are the most important factor in the global quest for a better world. Accordingly, all efforts geared towards the achievement of goal 16 and others should be people-centered. In addition to eradicating poverty, hunger, and disease, we should ensure that all human beings can fulfill their potential in dignity and equality in a safe and a healthy environment. Parity is the second word. Parity also means equality. We should pursue national and international policies that promote equality at all levels and ensure inclusive, participatory, and representative decision-making at all levels. Through the enactment and enforcement of non-discriminatory laws and policies, we can eradicate discriminatory culture and practices at all levels. In particular, countries should aim at achieving full gender equality and participation of women at all levels of decision making. The third P is peace. That's supposed to be a dove. We should foster peaceful, just, and inclusive societies that are free from fear and violence. Countries and governments should identify and tackle the root causes of conflict, such as bad governance, intolerance, um, and abuse of human rights, and should combat factors that fuel conflict, such as the flow of illicit arms and finance. Governments should protect vulnerable groups like women and children from violence, exploitation, displacement, and abuse in all its forms, and should combat organized crime like slavery and human trafficking. In terms of power, we need to build strong, effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels of government, including the legislature, the judiciary, the executive, local governments, etc. In order to truly empower the people, governments should effect policies that promote uh, transparency and combat corruption in public institutions and foster a climate that enables the people to hold elected officials accountable. Professional and independent judicial institutions accompanied by appropriate legal aid schemes will ensure access to justice for all. Policy. Governments need to demonstrate political will through clear policies that promote democracy, rule of law, and respect for fundamental human rights. And lastly, partnerships. Regional and international bodies, such as the African Union, the European Union, and others, need to strengthen global solidarity by prioritizing peace, security, and justice on their agendas. States should put greater emphasis on prevention of conflict and on the Pacific settlement of disputes through mediation, negotiation, arbitration, and judicial settlement. Peacekeeping and peace building efforts should also be strengthened 
to prevent repetition of cycles of disaster. International courts and tribunals, too, need to promote efficiency, independence, and transparency internally and in the way they deal with member states. This will enhance the trust and use of these institutions by member states. These institutions also need to be more representative and inclusive in composition. As you know, the International Court of Justice is the, judicial, the, the principal judicial organ of the UN, whose main function is to decide such disputes as are submitted to it by states in accordance with international law. Its membership is quite representative in that it reflects or mirrors the membership of the Security Council. Gender-wise, however, uh, it's a shame that in the 70 years that the court and, it, and its predecessor have existed, out of the 106 judges elected to serve on the court, only four have been women, and the first of whom joined the court as late as 1995. Since the jurisdiction of the ICJ depends on state consent, more states should consider accepting the compulsory jurisdiction of the court by filing Article 36 declarations with the UN. Uh, in, in conclusion, I want to go back to Goal 16. SDG 16 is a goal of primordial importance, but without implementation of set targets, it will remain something on paper. Countries will need to put in place detailed action plans and review and accountability mechanisms in order to achieve this and other SDGs. I thank you. Uh, as I thank uh, Judge uh, Julia Seputinde for her illuminating talk, I will open for questions. Uh, there, there is one hand in the air. And an open microphone here. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for your presentation. Um, my question concerns one that I asked also yesterday. It concerns, uh, so in the, in the effort to provide access to justice for all, how much of that is, uh, includes animal rights? Or is it left up to countries? Um, if, if it doesn't include any conversation or any, any talk about that or any reference to animal rights and the peace of animal rights because they deserve freedom from fear of violence as well. So I wondered if, if it's up to individual countries to provide language around that and if, it doesn't, if it's not included at all, is, does this create an opportunity for, uh, for us to sort of change the conversation a little bit or change the reference? Thank you. I'm a lover of animals, and animals are a great part of um, the environment in Africa, as you probably know. But also the animals in Africa are an endangered species, especially the, the, the animals in the wild. So um, yes, by all means, I think um, the, the, the sustainability of, of our uh, economies, our tourism industries, etc should ensure that we protect uh, our animals in the wild as much um, as, as, as we, we, we can uh, in our countries. I think it's, it bo basically boils down to each country to have in place um, policies that will promote um, sustainable development. It's part of the sustainable development uh, because most countries in Africa do have a, a strong element of tourism. Um, I think South Africa is one, certainly Uganda is another. Uh, and if we are careless about the, the animal life in our game parks, in the next 30 years, we may not have a tourism industry to talk about. So I think that is, that is as much as I would say about the animal rights. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Musa from Norway, and my question goes to, uh, you say that uh, the ICJ tried to improve and provide 
access to justice for all. But if one goes back to the background uh, or the job done, many things have been done, but also some critics may say that uh, the ISJ has become a court for the weak and the poor, where the mighty and the rich can more or less become out, uh, outlaws. Uh, many experiences are there, uh, and uh, we have had the experience of uh, the president of Sudan with all controversies in South Africa. Uh, recently, Tony Blair has declared that now he, he can apologize, and I wonder if the, the, the simple apology is also an excuse not to be judged. And many others who committed atrocities, but happens to be rich and strong and powerful. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I think you do somehow confuse two different institutions. The court with which I am working is called the International Court of Justice. It is uh, a UN body. But I think the court that you are asking about is the International Criminal Court, also sitting in The Hague. It's a totally different body. It's not a United Nations body. Uh, but I, I want to comment a little bit about that sentiment, which is uh, quite widely um, shared, especially on the African continent. And I must say that I think, to be fair to the, to the ICC, one needs to go back to how the ICC came to be and how uh, member states signed up to the Rome Statute. Way back 20, 21, 22 years ago when they signed up to the Rome Statute, um, the member states were mindful of the need of establishing a permanent international criminal court uh, to address the, the crimes and to extend justice we're talking about justice for all, justice to the victims of war crimes, of genocide, and of Christ's crimes against humanity. The court was primarily set up for victims of these offenses. It was not set up for um, member states per se. It was set up for victims. So it so happens, it so happens, and I think you will agree with me, that a large percentage of the victims of these crimes have happened to be in Africa as a result of, of internal conflicts, external conflicts, interstate conflicts, and so on and so forth. And that is how come that the, the, the cases now before uh, the court, the ICC, uh, happen to involve suspects from those situations. And I think it was one of the speakers this morning who said uh, that the situations are self-referrals. I know that I come from a country, a situation country, where we referred, we were one of the first countries to refer a case to the ICC. Now, I think in my view, it would be wrong for Uganda today to turn around and start accusing the ICC of trying the very people that we asked them to try because we were either unable or unwilling to do so at the time. I cannot speak for other countries, but I know that uh, in all other cases of self-referrals, um, these countries cannot stand on their leg and honestly say that the ICC has been unfair for dealing with a situation that they refer to it. Now, I cannot say much about other situations that we imagine exist. Uh, I've heard people say, oh, so-and-so from such and such a country should also appear before the ICC. In my country, we have a saying that if you are caught as a thief, it will not help you to say, ah, but the neighbor is also a thief. Why don't you catch them? It's better to focus on, on ourselves, on the people in our countries, on the victims uh, of our countries. For example, in my country, I, my heart goes out to the victims of, you know, of the conflict in the northern part of the country who have waited some 30 years to see the first suspect now sitting in The Hague face trial, 30 years. Some have died without ever seeing that possibility. Should they have to wait 30 years 
to have access to justice for them? I think not. And for me as a judge, as a lawyer, as a woman, as an African living in a conflict country, am I to focus on why the ICC is not prosecuting suspect X from Y country? Or must I focus on the victims in my country and on justice for them? This is how I would address the question that you have put to me. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you for your truly inspirational speech. Um, I'm Raphael Dapper, um, Minister of Defence, United Kingdom. So the general message I took from your speech was that in order to facilitate global solidarity and peace, justice and security, there needs to be greater collaboration and um, unity between bodies such as the EU and the African Union. However, how do we facilitate this when within these institutions, I speak in particular regards to the EU, there's a lack of cohesion, there's a lack of unity, there's a lack of solidarity. So how can we you know, promote this on a global level? Thank you. I, I'm, I'm not sure that I have an answer um, to that question. Um, but I, I will speak about the AU rather than the EU. I'm not too familiar with what's going on inside the EU. But I have some inkling of what's going on within the AU and um, its approach to um, international law, uh, its approach to some of these international institutions that have been set up. Uh, I, I must say that, for instance, in the, in the International Court of Justice, I'm happy with the way um, that states, African states, are resorting more and more to the use of the court uh, to resolve interstate disputes as opposed to conflict. Because states can choose conflict as a way of deciding their disputes. But more and more countries do come um, to, to the ICJ for dispute resolution. And that's a good thing. It speaks to the confidence that states have in the world court as a, a, a forum where they can come for, for peaceful settlement. Now, the, the, the question of, of the International Criminal Court, I think, remains a thorn in the flesh. And for me personally, I think that the leadership of the African Union has not been fair to its people and have very um, masterfully uh, spun the accusation that the International Criminal Court is anti-African, which is not true. Um, thereby uh, inciting members to pull out of this organization, which I think serves a very useful purpose. Um, I say masterf masterfully spun because, again, if, if, if you zoom in on the reality on the ground, all the reasons that have been given don't really hold water. They can fly uh, in, in the minds of, of, of simple people, in the villages, maybe even people who do not know the inside story, who do not um, analyze uh, too far. But in reality, I'll give you an example um, in my country where Uganda was in the forefront um, of asking other countries to pull out of the ICC arrangement. The reason being that they were very angry when uh, the, the prosecutor uh, purported to prosecute the, the Kenyan um, heads of state, the president and the vice president. And uh, we, we really were in the forefront of, of, of this drive. And we threatened, as Uganda, that we were not going to cooperate anymore with the court in terms of um, uh, telling, giving them you know, diplomatic immunity when they come to, to, the, to the country to look for evidence, etc., protection, all that. Uh, forgetting that we had a case pending in that court. Uh, I don't know why, I can only surmise why um, it mattered, probably because the suspects in Kenya were leaders of a country, and there was uh, worry that 
this might open up new avenues of conflict within the country. But then, many, uh, a few months later, a particular suspect of no importance uh, was arrested from Uganda and taken to, uh, to The Hague um, to be tried for the, the war crimes committed by the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army. And because this man was not, was not a leader of any um, standing, the Uganda government was very um, cooperative and, and helpful to the prosecutor. And I know that the prosecutor visited the country with great trepidation, not knowing uh, how she was going to be received, but she was received like a long lost daughter. And, and the president assured her of all the um, help that, that she needed. And true to his word, they have helped uh, the prosecution and the defense in gathering evidence. So for me, the, the, the conclusion I draw from that is that as long as a prosecution is not targeted as an African leader, at an African leader, that prosecution is fine with the African Union. But as long as that prosecution touches on an African leader, then it's a very sore spot. The question is, should there be that differentiation? It doesn't matter to the victims. If there are crimes that have been committed and the victims exist, they should have equal justice or access to justice. And it shouldn't matter that the suspect holds a political office. Because this is what the Rome Statute says, actually, that, that a person's political office is, is irrelevant when it comes to warrants and indictments, as indeed, I think, in other countries, it, it is the same. Um, that said, though, uh, I want to say that there is also in the Rome Statute an avenue for domestic application of the Rome Statute, where countries that feel they do not want to submit themselves to the jurisdiction of the court, the ICC, have incumbent upon them the duty to set up a national court that will try war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. Um, as far as I know, I think in Africa, only one or two countries, Senegal I think is the one country that I know of, uh, that have set up a working court to try um, those kinds of suspects domestically. So all the others, uh, for all the dust that they're raising, they have that option, but they've not picked it up to enact domestic legislation um, that, that uh, incorporates the Rome Statute. And the question is why? Why not? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Judge uh, Julia Sebutinda. Uh, please join me in applauding her for her talk and in deference.